Welcome to Pricing WordPress, the podcast that helps to remove the mystery and stress from pricing WordPress products and services. I'm your host, Keith Devon, and in this episode, I'm chatting with the effervescent Jody Riccelli. Jody is the business development manager of Web Dev Studios, a US based WordPress development agency who specializes in enterprise level projects. This conversation was fascinating for me as it gives an insight into the big budget, big brand world that can seem a bit mysterious and intimidating from the outside. Jody has some great advice and insights into client management, the sales process, and of course, pricing. I really appreciated her honesty and openness in discussing what some people might think of as the secret sauce. It's also good to know that no one actually has all of this figured out. Pricing WordPress is supported by us at High Rise Digital. High Rise Digital is a UK-based specialist WordPress development team focused on providing long-term development services for businesses based on WordPress. If you'd like to learn more about us, you can visit highrise.digital. Now let's get on with the show. I hope that you enjoy my conversation with Jody Riccelli. Hey, Jody, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So today we're going to be talking about pricing WordPress development projects and specifically the kind of bigger projects that you guys work on at Web Dev Studios. First of all, though, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you and about Web Dev Studios. So how did you come to be involved in WordPress? It's a very funny story, actually. I was working in the music industry, actually, uh, back in about 2005. So it was a, it was a little bit, it was a long time ago. Not to date myself, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> um, and at the time, artists, musicians were using MySpace really as their main source of online presence. And I had an inclination very early on that MySpace would probably not be around forever. Um, And we needed an alternative to get some of these artists online. And my partner at the time uh, downloaded all of these tutorials for WordPress and a copy of GIMP, which is the open source Photoshop type editing suite, and gave me a laptop and said, do you think you could figure this out? Because we need some websites for our artists. So I spent an entire weekend digging through tutorials and trying to learn what WordPress was all about. And ended up creating my first site that weekend, which was not very exciting. And I was clearly never a designer. I learned that very, very quickly. Um, and so that was my introduction. And then I really started to enjoy it and kind of embrace it as a tool to use for a variety of things. And not soon after, the music industry really took a, a sharp turn. And artists started to make money in different ways. And it wasn't mm. the traditional grassroots ways that I was used to. Um, And although I loved that line of work, it was time for me to make a little bit of a transition. And I was offered a position to do sales for WordPress websites. This was probably 2009. And and I thought that it was really a culmination of all my past experience kind of coming together. My knowledge now of what I had of WordPress anyway, and some of the other really terrible jobs that I've had in my past, it all seemed to come to a head. And so I took this position. And I started doing website sales for smaller businesses, and I really enjoyed it. I ended up doing that for five years. Um, During that time, I got involved in the WordPress community, especially the Philadelphia WordPress meetup um, and a lot of the variety of WordCamps. And I was familiar with Web Dev Studios because they were an agency you wanted to strive to be like. It was really run by pioneers within the WordPress community. And I knew that that was going to be a step up for me. So when I was leaving my previous job, I was lucky enough to know Brad Williams, who is our CEO at Web Dev Studios, because he also lives in Philadelphia. I had a conversation with him and then we just, we connected. And then Lisa Sabin Wilson, who's our COO, I had an opportunity to talk to her um, and they offered me a position. And that was three years ago. So I came in actually as a client strategist. I wasn't really doing business development at the time. I was doing strategy. So that was interesting. And my role has really changed over the last three years. 
So a client, just to quickly dig into that, a client strategist, is that is that strategy for clients or client strategy for web dev studios? <laughs> for clients. So I would, once the sale is made, essentially, I would work with the client to write their project plan and then yep. transition that over to the development team. Because I had this technical knowledge, which my knowledge was much stronger than my implementation, to be fair, but I could talk about WordPress, I could explain it. I could think, um, I thought of myself as a translator from client to developers. Mm -hmm. So, and that role quickly evolved because what I found quickly that I was best at was having conversations with clients about what they needed or the challenges that they were having and getting that into some kind of tangible document. Yeah. And that's a very, very valuable skill. (laughs) It is, um, it's a, you know, it's a little bit of a unicorn skill to find somebody who can talk about technology and not really want to do it. I found a lot of people who are great about talking about tech or talking with clients about technology in any capacity actually are engineers mm-hmm. um, or project managers, let's say. And I was never good at either of those things. <laughs> so yeah. this was a really good role for me to fall into. So how do you, how do you stay on top of the techno- technological developments when you're not like implementing it day to day? So to be fair, I still tinker a lot as much as I possibly can. And one thing that I always wish that I did better was code. So it's still a goal of mine, even though I'm not probably going to do it for anyone to use. For my own personal experience, it is still important that I try to do things. I watch yep. a lot of online tutorials. I take classes. I meet with our partners often too. So um, you, hosting companies or, or partners that have new tools and kind of consume as much information as I can from them. And then, of course, we have such a brilliant team of engineers. I mm-hmm. lean on them heavily. And I jump into their conversations or their lunch and learns that they hold. Um, to try to just keep on top of what they're doing. I always yeah. run things past them. I don't obviously make decisions on my own. It's very much um, a, a, an effort, all of us communicating one another to deliver a solution to a client. Yeah. But I, I need to understand it. I need to keep up with them. So I'm constantly learning. It's never ending. So you're now the business development manager. Mm-hmm. How has so how did the role change from the client strategist to business development manager? What does that look like? Like what are your how did your responsibilities change? Well, I don't write project plans anymore, which is I'm sure everyone is very grateful because even though I was pretty good at it, um, it's not going to ever be a substitution for a technical person coming in, like a truly technical person coming in and writing that for the developers. Okay. Now my day-to-day consists of um, working leads as they come through, of course, working, focusing on more outbound reach for clients. So I would say that Web Dev Studios has a pretty specific niche now, which um, I'm not sure we always had, but we've really been able to narrow down the industries that we want to target. So a lot of my job is finding companies or clients within those industries and just starting a conversation with them. When you're in the enterprise space, it is a very, very, very long sales cycle. And I'm very cognizant of that. So if I start talking with somebody today, it might be a year, it could even be two years before they're going to engage in any work with us. Um, So meetings, lunches, going out to see them face to face, there is no substitution, in my opinion, for a face to face meeting with a client. So as much as I can do that, I want to do that. Yeah. Um, but I also spend a lot of time on the phone working through the sales cycle with clients or video calls, for instance, um, really understanding what it is that they need. The majority of the clients that we're working with, this isn't a one-off project. They just need, they don't need a one website and we're done. It is, they have a network of websites or they have a strategy that they're building. And so potentially there is a long-term amount of work available with this client. I need to oftentimes prioritize, figure out what we could start with or how we're both we're best going to enter into working with them um, and then put that plan together in a way that makes sense, that meets their timelines and meets their budgets. You guys work with some pretty big, big companies. So can you tell us a bit about the types of people you work with? Yeah, I'm so lucky. I feel so fortunate to be able to work with the clients that I do. 
So Microsoft is probably one of our largest clients. And that's always a fun one to talk about, talk about because you know, Microsoft is notorious for proprietary software and technologies, but they even understood the importance of embracing open source to some extent. So that, that's always been a fun one to work with. Uh, Viacom is another one of our clients. Yeah. So uh, brands like MTV or Comedy Central, um, that's super fun to be able to work on projects with them. Uh, yeah. News Corp is one of our newer clients, and so they have a myriad of publications uh, that we are working on some editorial tools to build some editorial tools using WordPress, which has been really exciting. NBA is another one of our clients, and so um, that's obviously being in the sports arena is something that our engineers love, and that <laughs> uh, you know being able to go to the NBA office in Times Square is just, I can't even put that into words sometimes, how incredible that opportunity is. And yeah. then of course, Campbell Soup Company is another one of our, our largest clients. They happen to be near me. I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, Campbell Soup Company is headquartered about 15 minutes away from me. And they've been a client for a, a long time. And of course, they have hundreds of different brands underneath them. And so we really have the opportunity to touch each of those individual brands like Tim Tams or Pepperidge Farm. Um, but the list goes on and on. So I would say that they're probably our top five right now. There are, there are some pretty big names. It doesn't get too much bigger than Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And I just, I really do feel so lucky every time I get to go to Seattle and sit in an office in Microsoft and I look around at our team and I look around at where we are and I think, this is really a dream job. I mean, mm -hmm. what other opportunity would I have to sit with C-level executives, IT directors, marketing directors in one room and be able to provide them a solution that they're going to implement um, to a big, large portion of the company? That's really exciting. Let's talk about what those solutions might look like then. So um, you don't have to give a specific example, but for those types of clients, what kind of work are you doing? Again, most of these clients have multiple sites. And what we're seeing more and more right now is WordPress decoupled. Um, and it's more the editorial tools that are available in WordPress that enterprise level clients are really embracing. Because let's face it, WordPress started as a blogging platform. One of the things that it still does best to this day is manage content, right? I mean, that's really one of its main intentions behind WordPress was to manage content and manage it well. And it does that so beautifully and it's very easy to use. So when we decouple it from whatever it is on the front end, and that could be, that could look like a million different ways, we're really thinking about what does this operational workflow look like for this client? So I'm an editor and I'm going to go into WordPress and I'm going to post new content. How do I get the media in there correctly? How do I, you know, figure out what SEO terms I need? Um, I might need two or three or four different titles, depending on where this is going to be posted and yeah. maybe a variety of different summaries. So these are the questions that we want to ask. How are you using it to manage content? I mean, that is pretty much one of the main scenarios. The other advantage is um, when you have an enterprise client that has multiple brands, Using a multi-site setup with one parent theme or one framework or whatever it is for that particular client situation, they can really spin up sites super quick. So if you're a marketing director and you have an event coming up, being able to go into your multi-site install, spin up a new event site using an already existing theme or framework, you can get that done in a day. And so to people who yeah. where content, it needs to be quick and it needs to be efficient, there is no better way to do it. So that there are the typical scenarios of the work that we do. Bringing it back to pricing, now that we've got a bit of context about what you do and who you do it for, if one of those large companies comes to you and they, they want to develop, say, uh, a multi-site with specific kind of publishing needs, how do you get from those initial conversations, meetings, lunches, to a place where you say, here's the price? Yeah, that's like the million dollar question, right? I think if somebody had the right magic formula for pricing projects, they would be a millionaire. Because I don't know, in my experience, talking with people, if anyone has the perfect solution yet. Um, but there's a, there's a number of factors that have to go into it. So first of all, it's determining working with their purchasing department. What is the contract type they most feel comfortable with? 
So is it going to be time and materials? Is it a retainer? Or is it project pricing? Um, we are still open to doing a variety of different pricing strategy, strategies depending on a client because sometimes that could be the difference between getting the project and not. If they're really fixated on a way that they want a project priced, you either can be flexible or not work with them. So depending on who the client is, sometimes we, we may have to make considerations about how we price things. So it's first determining how this is going to be priced. Project, flat project pricing never works. I think that we all know that. Um, it's great for small projects, uh, but I don't necessarily think that once you get into six figures, it's going to be effective, right? And so if that's something that's required by the client, that's a real conversation that we need to have internally. Do we want to set the project off on this foot? Because mm -hmm. potentially it could go really bad and then you're not going to have a good relationship with that client anyway. So sometimes it's it maybe not even worth it to kind of pursue that. But if it's a client that you really want, one way I would go about it is to start by saying, let's just do a discovery first. Let's yeah. isolate the discovery as the first project. We can flat price that all day. Um, let's do a discovery project. And then we'll be able to give you a more definitive estimate um, on how we would move forward for this. So if we're going to go the flat rate route, I think that doing discovery first or a paid discovery session of some capacity first is really imperative. Yeah. So, but you wouldn't necessarily do that with one of the other pricing models. So going into the other pricing models, like let's say we were doing time and materials. That's easy. Sprint one is audit discovery. Sometimes it may take more than one sprint, but you are starting with that, right? But when it's time and materials, you may have some parameters around it, but usually you don't, right? We just know mm -hmm. that there's an hourly rate that was agreed upon with the client and that could be based on a rate card or it could be a blended rate. Again, those are that's a conversation we need to have with every client too. Some clients want a rate card because they feel that they're going to have more control over what it is that they're they're spending, but some clients are completely happy with a blended rate. And I personally prefer using a blended rate because you know, we may have a challenge that um, a new engineer is working on and we need to pull in a senior level. Uh, to go back to the client and explain, hey, listen, we need to pull in a senior level now for an hour or two or blah, 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 blah. Like it just opens the door to a million questions and they're not always the most fun conversations to have. So if you're working with a blended rate, it gives the agency a lot of flexibility to do what they need to do to get the project done. So just for people possibly including myself that don't maybe 100% know what a blended mm -hmm. rate means, am I right in thinking that is a flat rate and you guys work out internally the combination of, of people and, and seniority and skill sets that are needed for the project and then come up with a kind of average rate and that's the rate you give the client? It's exactly it. It's like the average of your rate card for that particular yeah. project. Um, it's really one of my preferred ways to work because I think that you can just move a little bit more steadily going using that. When you yeah. get into a rate card reporting, I know our project managers, they're great at what they do. But reporting for a rate card on a project that has hundreds of hours per month is a really tedious, tedious task. And so it helps mm -hmm. even with that a lot too. So um, if we're going to go into the time and materials route, it's one, establishing what's this rate going to be? Is it going to be a rate card? Is it going to be a blended rate? Again, that's just having conversations with the client to gauge their comfort level. And then using the first couple of sprints, depending on how big the project is, maybe one sprint, two sprint for discovery and audit before we start figuring out what's going to be next to do the project. Yeah. Um, if we're doing a retainer, uh, that's a little bit more straightforward. Month one, retainer hours, audit discovery, prioritizing tasks that are going to be done for the rest of the engagement. Um, and so during that first month, we can really figure out how many months we're going to be working on this or how many hours we need to allocate per month for this retainer going forward. And then that's just going to be a flat fee every month. We work X amount of hours. They don't roll over. Um, you know, we are, we're, we're very much planned out in advance for the length of that project. But I think recently my favorite way <laughs> to propose a project is really what we've been referring to. And this is not a new concept, but I just, um, 
have had a lot of success with it is the scalable retainer. So there is a minimum number of hours per month, a minimum length of engagement, but the previous month we have a resourcing meeting with the client for the upcoming month and Mm -hmm. determine if we need to increase those hours. And that could be increased depending on their needs or what resources we have available. And then we schedule accordingly and then just bill them for that particular month. So there's always a minimum. So you know you can forecast out for at least the minimum. Um, you know that you have some guaranteed cash flow coming every single month. But when it's a bigger project, you have that flexibility then to increase the amount of work on any given month, uh, which really helps, again, move the project along more smoothly. One of the challenges, and that's kind of like time and materials, right? And it's kind of like a retainer. It's a little bit of a hybrid. But I found that one of the challenges always with time and materials is resourcing, right? You don't know if a client's going to need 50 hours or 200 hours a month sometimes. And even though we have nearly, I mean, we're, we're approaching in on about 40 people at WebDev Studios right now. Um, we're booked, right? So yeah. I would rather have some kind of minimum in the schedule. So there's guaranteed work that we'll be doing with that client for a period of time that helps with forecasting. It helps with cash flow. It helps with resourcing. It helps with, um, you know, just quarter planning from a marketing perspective too. Um, So I think that there's a lot of advantages in doing either a retainer or some kind of scalable retainer with a client. And that's really going to be my preferred method, or at least what I'm going to try to push first. Yeah, that's the hybrid approach sounds really cool. I wonder, I, I know certainly at the kind of level that we work at, a lot of our clients want fixed prices and, and understandably you say that's very difficult at the really high level. I mean, do, you, do, do clients at the enterprise level just inherently understand that that's not realistic? Do they, or, or do they still come to you saying, how much will this cost? They always come and say, how much will this cost? Okay. I mean, everybody wants the price, right? Yeah. And I get it. I understand it. I'm not knocking it. They have budgets that they need to sometimes put in months in advance. Um, you know, if I'm working with a marketing manager, for, for instance, she has 10 people above her that she needs to answer to and account for those funds to. So I get the need for having some kind of pricing. But I also don't want to get into a position where with a client where we give an estimate and then a month or two later, I have to call them up and say, hey, remember that estimate? Well, I'm going to need X amount of dollars more now because oops, we got in there and there was a hundred things that we found were wrong. Um, So if, if a new enterprise client is coming to us and they are demanding some kind of flat rate pricing, or at least even a range, we will work with them. Um, I'm going to actually back up for a second. Another thing to consider when you're working at an enterprise level is that the majority of these companies have a marketing department they have an IT department, and they have internal project managers. So most of the time, they're not coming to us with nothing. They have, an, they have designs or they have wireframes. They have a marketing strategy in place. They have a generalized list of work that they believe needs to be done for a particular project. So there is an advantage there where we are given some information to start with, more so than maybe with a new client on a smaller business level, who's really just like, I don't know what I want, right? So working on an enterprise level, you're going to get a little bit of a baseline to start with. We can go through and put ranges or hours or even like t-shirt sizing around tasks. This is a small, medium, large task, or this Mm -hmm. is 10 hours, 20 hours, 50 hours, and come up with some kind of number at the end of that. But my caveat with that, and it always is, Listen, I'm going to give you this number, but you need to at least budget 15% more at the very Mm -hmm. least, if not 20. Um, Also, you need to be open to the fact that if there is one thing that is even the slightest bit out of scope, it is going into a phase two bucket. And that's just the way that it needs to be. Um, And we'll often break those projects down into smaller chunks. So it's a little bit easier to manage because starting with a thousand hours is you know, that could be a little bit daunting and overwhelming. So it's just, let's you let's start with this small piece and then move into this piece and then move into this piece. Um, but once you get through that first project and the client trusts you and they see the work that you're doing, and they also see that your engineers are not trying to take advantage of the hours or 
take advantage of the time that they're paying for, they're going to be a lot more likely to engage with you on a retainer and follow-up projects because they understand how you work now, right? So my number one job, and, and I am not delusional when I say this, is I'm not selling our development work. I am selling our engineers on any given day. They are really the commodity that I work with Mm -hmm. because they are the team that does all the magic. They are the ones that engage with the client the most. I I mean, I'm going to build trust with the client in the beginning of the process. But when I hand it over to that development team, I never doubt that that client is going to be blown away. I believe that in my core, when I sit down with a new client, that if they can just get through me, and they get to that team, they are going to be a client for life. And I never, ever, ever question that or doubt that. So once I can get them into some kind of engagement or some kind of project, I know that it's going to be done so well, I'll be able to work with them on how we move forward. When does price first come up in a conversation? And is it it you normally bringing it up or is it the client normally bringing it up? It's always me, I feel like. Um, I don't want to beat around the bush either. So if on our, if you were to fill out our contact form right now on web dev studios and that lead were to come in, if you didn't give us a lot of information, the first question you would get back is what is your timeline and do you have a budget? I need to know that because well, one, will it fit within our current work queue and schedule? That's why timing is important. And two, I could do anything. Literally with web development, I could give you anything. I could give you a a page builder website that's five pages, that's super inexpensive, or I can build you, you know, a 30 install multi-site with localization and, you know, all the bells and whistles that is going to easily be close to, you know, in six figures. So by giving me a budget, it's not me saying that I'm going to cut you out and say we can't work with you because your price isn't enough or well, there's never going to be a situation where it's too high, but uh, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. What I need to know, be able to do is gauge how I do this estimate for you, what route I need to take, what technologies are going to come into play, what team members would be best suited for this. So when I'm talking to a client about, about price, that's really how I phrase it. Like, I have to ask you this question. I know it's uncomfortable, but please understand it's not the amount that I'm looking for. I want to give you the best solution and I don't want to take you off guard. So do you have a budget in mind? And even let's say I'm talking to a small business client and they say 50,000, right? Even if I do that estimate and it comes to 90, I'm not going to just make it into 50. I'm going to show them the 90 and why it is that and then figure out how we can reduce it down to a budget that they're more comfortable with. And I also explain that to them. Uh, I'll say, listen, you're going to get back the best proposal for your project. It may not fit within this budget. I'm going to be very upfront about that right now, but I want to know what you're feeling. And then I don't send the proposal over and let them look at the number and have a heart attack or feel stressed about it. I'll get on the phone and walk through the proposal with them and explain everything that we are going to do for the amount that I am proposing to them. Mm -hmm. And it puts more context behind it. And I've had a lot of success with that too. Even people who said their budget was 50 and I showed them something that's 90, they get it. They understand the value behind it and they're willing to move forward. I mean, there are times where people are like, absolutely not, it has to be 50, let's figure out how to get it there. And I'm happy to work with them on that too. Um, But I wouldn't be doing my job if I undercut a pricing just to get a client because that also never works. You get that client in at a discount or whatever, and I promise you that project's going to go bad because that's just how it happens. Um, But if you're very upfront and very honest, and and I will always say to them, listen, this is an estimate. Again, you need to budget more. We need to think about hosting at some point. Um, We're going to be thinking about phase two work. What about maintenance and support? There's all costs that are associated with this that are going to come up. So even though I'm giving you an amount, we need to be prepared for anything more. So if you're comfortable with this, great, but let's really think of this 90 as 120. Um, And that's what you need to put in your budget. Um, If I've done it before, right? We've all done it before where we've been in a situation where we have a client who says their budget is 30 and you're like, okay, I can just do this, 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 this. You give them the proposal, you start on the project 
and they're really looking for a hundred thousand dollar site. And so they're not getting what it is that they want. And they become frustrated. The project doesn't go well. And chances are you're not going to work with them in the long term either. So I'd rather set the expectations up front um, and be very honest about our pricing and how we work before we get into the project. And by getting it out of the way in the beginning, it's like the elephant in the room is gone and you could ease into the conversation a lot more smoothly or or weed them out. You know, if they say like my budget's a thousand dollars and I want YouTube. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to be able to help you. That's not to say that somebody can't, but it's not going to, it can't be me. Are there any tools that you use regularly whenever there is a little bit of pushback on price? You know, I've heard some people, they change payment terms slightly to like make it more favorable. You know, they have deliberately like really kind of aggressive payment terms and then they'll, they'll use that as a tool to like say, okay, well, we can't drop the price, but we'll change the payment terms of this instead. Do you have any like, kind of tricks and techniques that you use? I, I mean, okay, yes, I have in the past, right? Um, one of the things that I have done is offer um, either a, few, a year of maintenance and support and no additional yep. charge. So Maintain is the sister company of Web Dev Studios. Maintain is our maintenance and support branch. That's a nice little incentive for me to be able to add to clients and say, we're going to do a year of maintenance and support for you, you know, if you're willing to um, engage with us on this particular project. So I, I have done that. I've also um, willingly and gratefully will offer discounts to nonprofit organizations that we want to work with because they have a lot of budget challenges. Usually mm-hmm. it's coming from a grant or donor funding. And so their pricing tends to be pretty fixed. Um, in what they can do. So if a nonprofit that we really believe in the work that they're doing comes along and they have a budget of say 80,000 and we know the project's going to be 90, I could discount a little bit in order to uh, better meet their budget to work with them because again, they're doing good work. We understand why they have um, budget restrictions and we want to actually work with that particular client. Other things that I have tried or done is to break it down into smaller projects, like saying, okay, you're not comfortable with this. Let's do discovery first. Again, we talked about this a little bit, but let's see how close I was on this estimate. We'll do discovery first, come up with a full technical project plan and a full estimate, and we'll compare it to what I estimated. If you want to work with us to do the development, great. If you don't, you still have a deliverable. You still have a project plan that you could take to any other agency and work with them to build out. And the only reason I can do that, again, is because I feel so confident in the team that I know once we get through the project planning and the strategy, the client's going to say, okay, I get it now. And we'll want to continue and move forward. Yeah. What I won't do, however, is discount for the sake of discounting. So there, if there is a client who has a $30,000 budget and a $60,000 project, I'm not going to fit that same project into their budget. I'm either going to cut the scope considerably and explain to them why, or, you know, we may not be the best fit for them and that's fine. Um, but we can also do things like, um, you know, a client who's really set on pricing. I could say, all right, you have $80,000 that translates into X amount of hours. Over six months, that's X amount of hours per month. We're just going to work those hours, give you a report. And when we get to the end, you'll have something. And you may need more work, but you'll have something. But you'll know where every hour is going. You've got a rate card. uh, So different levels and, and rules within the organization will have different rates. Where do those rates come from? Do you, are you comparing to a kind of market average and then kind of, setting them high or low based on your kind of strategy or how, how do you come up with a rate for a developer? Our rate is our rate and it's ne- and it changes given um, inflation in the economy, mm-hmm. but it is very competitive with other agencies, our size mm-hmm. um, and other agencies that work with clients that we work with. Yeah. Um, but it does, I never change the hourly rate for a client. They can either do a rate card, a blended rate or a flat hourly rate. But I would never say, okay, our hourly rate is, let's just use round numbers. Our hourly rate is $10 an hour. We know it's not $10 an hour, but um, (laughs) I would never say to a client, for you though, I'm going to make it five. Because the reason 
that I have not, I, I, again, I used to, this was kind of through trial and error. What I found would happen when we reduce that hourly rate for a client any work going forward always needed to be that rate. You're never going to get it back up. So all I can do is reduce the scope or the amount of work to get a price down. Yeah. Um, because once you lower that hourly rate, you literally have no more wiggle room going forward. Unless you've made it very clear, like I'm only going to discount this hourly rate for this one project, but I'm pretty confident when you go to do another project, they're going to ask for that same hourly rate and not be thrilled if you're giving them a higher one. Now, there is one exception to this rule, and that is an enterprise client that is signing on with us for multiple years mm -hmm. that we know we're going to get work with for a long time, and there's going to be a ton of projects and a ton of work going forward. During the MSA negotiation process, we may be willing to lower the hourly rate for them because, again, looking ahead, we're going to be you know, overall getting so much work that it would be worth it for us to do that. But on a regular one-off project that's coming through, it's just setting you up to fail. You work in some different markets, different sizes of business, although it seems obviously like enterprise is, is a bit of a focus. Um, but I know you do work with some smaller businesses as well, and you work in different industries. How does your pricing strategy differ between those different horizontals and verticals? So much of the pricing strategy for an enterprise client depends on what they have in place. So if you've ever worked with a procurement department at a, at a major company, they usually come to you with the terms. Like yeah. our, our hourly rate that we want you to give us is this. Our net payment terms is this. And you either can accept those, negotiate those, or choose not to work with the client. When we're getting into more medium size or smaller businesses, um, again, the hourly rate is what it is, right? The only thing that I can do is offer you different solutions for your budget. A perfect example is um, Maintain, who I mentioned earlier, has a small business arm of their particular business where they're doing small business websites that are deployed a lot quicker and they're a lot more inexpensive than Web Dev Studio's custom development. So perhaps a small business client comes to me and they only have $10,000 or $15,000 to, to work on their site. Obviously, a custom solution is not going to be great for them. It's just not going to work. Um, and we're not the best fit. But Maintain can help them because Maintain is going to start with a page builder or a framework. And maybe they're not doing a full design phase. Um, maybe they're not doing a full discovery. They're just kind of keeping it simple. Five pages, small business website. We kind of know what you need to get you started. Um, and so that's an easy way for me to work with a small business client who maybe doesn't have a lot of funds accessible to them at the moment. And I get it. If you're starting a business and you are a small business, every single penny counts. And mm -hmm. so we want to be able to deliver you a fantastic product with a budget that you're comfortable with. And that's a way that I can do it. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about a medium sized business who maybe has a little bit more expendable cash or, um, a bigger budget to work on a particular project, uh, it is all going to be about me working with them to fit, to tell them what I can do for the budget that's available to them. Now that's if they'll give me the budget, which is one thing we didn't talk about. Not all clients are going to be upfront about that. Yeah. There are a lot of clients will say to you, I can't share that yet. We want to see what you all come in at and compare it to the other proposals. And then we'll tell you, you know, what we were thinking. And that happens a lot with like medium, small businesses. Um, so the best that I can do is just do the best estimate possible and review it with them and explain why it is. And I've had clients say, but this, we all have, this other agency <laughs> quoted me $20,000 less. What, why is yours different? And I'll say, you know, well, I didn't see that particular proposal. I have no idea what they're proposing to you. Um, it could be comparing apples and oranges, or it could be very similar. I mean, if you want to share the specs, not the proposal, because I don't ever want to really see that. But if you want to share their specs that they're delivering to you, I'll be happy to do a comparison and show you where it's different. Yeah. But that's also a slippery slope because I don't want to get into like a battle with the client. The estimate that I'm giving them is accurate based on what we know about that project at the time. And it's based on, you know, that old adage, it's not about the 10 minutes that it takes you to do something, it's the 10 years that it took you to learn how to do it. 
Yeah. Right. So we have 11 years in the WordPress agency space, which is a lifetime for a, a development agency agency to be in existence. Mm-hmm. We have a proven track record of references and successful projects and a brilliant team of engineers. And that is my job to have the client understand that in a way that it, that equates to the price. Not, I don't want to get into a position where we're just talking about price because I'm never going to win. I'm probably going to be a little bit higher. I get yeah. that, right? But that's because of web dev and who they are. Um, so if I'm getting into a, a battle with you about specs and you're like, well, remove that contact form because I don't actually need that. That project's not going to go well. <laughs> it's it's interesting, actually, that you say that you do get uh, like lower budget inquiries that are really unrealistic because when I go to the Web Dev Studios website, it's very obvious to me that you guys are that you're experts and that you're at the higher end. Like you know, you have that client roster, that impressive client roster. You've got the list of books that you've literally written on WordPress that I've I've read. You know, <laughs> like yeah. one of the first WordPress books I got was one of Brad's ones. Um, so it, it kind of surprises me that that doesn't just filter everyone out. You're still getting you're still getting inquiries at like the lower the the low end. Yeah, and it's so fun for me. I will talk to anyone. I will <laughs> literally talk to anyone. It is one of the my favorite parts of the job, even if the request is completely. I already know it's not something that we're going to be able to do. I want to get on the phone with them because it's very enjoyable for me, not to make their life miserable, but I really want to understand what it is that they need and where they're coming from and see how I can maybe help them. I've referred people out to other agencies, to the WordPress job board. You know, I will give them any tool that I can um, to help them move forward with the project. But I think that there's this feeling of like, oh, this is the agency that works with Microsoft. I want to work with that agency. That sounds pretty mm. cool. How much could a WordPress site really be? Yeah. You know, how, how much could that be? It's got to be pretty inexpensive. They do, they have themes. They do all that stuff quick. I'm just going to yeah. see what happens. Yeah. WordPress is free, right? So it can't be. <laughs> right. It's got to be yeah. so easy to do that. They can just yeah. download a theme, put my contact in, spin it up and call it a day. And that's like, what, $1,000, $2,000 worth of work? And there is this perception out there for a certain group of people that that's how they view WordPress. Famous mm-hmm. five-minute install, right? Like and that, that is a reality too. I mean, that, that, that space does exist. It does. Know? It yeah. absolutely does exist. And so why wouldn't a leading WordPress agency mm. also be familiar with that, right? Yeah. So I understand and I get it. And there is a lot of education that needs to be done in my particular position too, because what is the difference between using something like Beaver Builder versus custom development? You know, to a client who's maybe just starting to understand these things, in their mind, there is no difference yet, right? So I really mm-hmm. need to be able to explain and articulate in a way that makes sense to them what the advantages and disadvantages are of both. And I'll be the first to say, if a client comes to us with a project and WordPress is not the best solution and they don't need custom development, I will tell them right away, listen, this is not, this is not the right technology for you or this is not the right solution for you and you need to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Um, and that happens a lot too. You know, some people want to build really intricate um, uh, backend systems that I don't necessarily know if WordPress would be the right solution, mm-hmm. maybe for parts of it, but maybe not the whole thing. You yeah. know, some people do need a decoupled instance where the front end is something that can handle the, the load or what they're trying to do with their particular project. Um, and so I want to be very upfront about that as well. Even though yeah. WordPress is nice and shiny and it does a lot of great things, I would be um, not a very good advocate if I was trying to fit it into every single square that exists out there. Yeah, absolutely. So on that, you are famous for being a WordPress development shop. Do you work with any other CMSs or any other technologies? So WordPress is always going to be our primary CMS. Um, and so that's where we're going to put all of our focus. What's, what's happening now, and I, I, you know, I've mentioned this a couple of times now, is that our clients really are appreciating what you can do because of the REST API. So on the front end, the technologies can really be endless. And so mm-hmm. we have been dabbling into a lot more of that. React, for instance, Gatsby, 
um, things of that nature. And um, that's been really exciting for me because I do believe that that's for the, in the enterprise space, that is the evolution of WordPress. Let it be the content management tool of choice. And let's think about how we can customize that content management experience for you in a way that works best for your business and mm -hmm. for the people that you work with. But on the front end, like look at all the endless possibilities and exciting things that we can do for you. Um, and so that's been really cool for me to see. What kind of exciting things can you do with some of those technologies that traditional WordPress architecture makes more difficult? I mean, number one is just performance and speed. Let's be honest. You put Gatsby on the front end of a website, that site is loading in a heartbeat. It is amazing what happens. But also, um, if you have, let's say, you know, you could, if it's a decoupled instance, you can do anything to the front end without having to worry about your WordPress install. Mm -hmm. You could put your WordPress install literally like on a $10 a month host. It's like completely separate. There's a lot of security advantages to doing it that way when you're a major organization. Um, and then, you know, also you can just get really creative with the way that you create a network of sites. Because again, we're not talking about like a one-off project. We're maybe talking about, let's say if it was a, a publication house, you might have 30 different publications that all can use WordPress to manage the content. But on the front end, every site needs something different because of where it's being served up or who the user is or what the experience should be like. Um, so it's given us the opportunity to provide comprehensive solutions to enterprise clients. Mm -hmm. Now for small and medium size, I'm not suggesting that that's the route that they need to go. WordPress is perfectly fine, probably front end and back end for everything that they need. Um, but that is a conversation that also needs to be had. What is the most important thing to you? Is it speed? Is it, you know, security? Is it content management? That's part yeah. of the job that I need to figure it out for a client. So clients are actually coming to you saying things like headless, decoupled, Gatsby. All of our, what? all of our enterprise, every single one. It's fascinating mm -hmm. because you did say, you did say earlier that like they all have internal IT teams. So they're, yeah. Yeah. They're on the pulse with, with this stuff. Or they come to us already with a decoupled instance and they're still they're just trying to focus on that editorial workflow for the back end mm -hmm. for WordPress. But out of the five that I named earlier, the five enterprise clients that I named earlier, I believe there's only one that's not decoupled. Yeah. The rest are. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. Which and it's a really nice segue into my next question, which was how is the enterprise market changing? Like, how has it changed in the last five years? You, know, you mentioned, you know, uh, headless and decoupled WordPress. And how do you think it's going to change in the next five? Yeah, so I, I really believe that that's the trajectory it's taking right now, right? We're going to see more decoupled instances because performance has become um, a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. um, people are moving towards progressive web apps. There's a lot of stuff happening with just um, different technologies on the front end that we need to be cognizant of. So if we're separating it, when WordPress, we can have a lot more control. On the WordPress end, if we're just using WordPress for the back end, for me, and I've been, I feel like I've been preaching about this for years, the most important thing is customizing that workflow in the back end of WordPress for the client because everybody's mm -hmm. needs are different. So as much time, like five years ago, as much time as we spent figuring out or doing user stories for the front end of the website, I want to do that now for the back end. Who are all the content editors? Let's write user stories out for each one of them and create an experience that is best suited for them. Because I have been, I've been in editorial houses talking with people who are doing content and they're still doing it in Google Docs and copying mm -hmm. and pasting it because it's easier to do collaborative editing in Google Docs or they're doing it in Word and they're copying and pasting it or they're just struggling getting images into WordPress or a, like a line break becomes a challenge, yeah. right? And so we know that Gutenberg has um, added a layer to make things a little bit easier for content management, but it's still not a customized experience. Um, so we want to be able to work with clients to figure that out for them. Mm -hmm. So that's one. The other thing that keeps, you know, coming up, and I think that we need to start having conversations about it is definitely more voice integration, whatever that looks like, whether it be, is like integrating with Google home or, um, Alexa, or just voice search 
that's something that I see more and more people kind of just starting to like dip their toe into about what they can do with it. Mm -hmm. Um, Accessibility is something that this is not new, nor is it a trend, but certainly something that um, enterprise level clients are much more cognizant of now than ever before. And so a lot of the work that we're doing right now is really just to address accessibility concerns that have been existent for years and years and years and years, and they need to be addressed and they need to be fixed. And so we're constantly doing that work. Um, and that is super, super, super important. And it should be one of the first things that anyone is talking about with their clients. What are your accessibility needs or concerns? Yeah. And what do we need to do to make sure that this is fully accessible? Um, and then also, I mean, thinking into the future, augmented reality and what that's going to look like for the websites that we're creating. I mean, we're not doing a ton of that work right now, but there's certainly people who want to have those conversations. And I always use the example of, when I was when I moved into my new home and I wanted to get area rugs, right? I found a site that allowed me to place virtually the rug in the space before I purchased yeah. it. So yeah. e-commerce and education, I see augmented reality becoming a huge thing. Um, and we do a lot of internal training portals for clients too. That's a, actually something we didn't talk about, but something that we do quite often, like we did one for Starbucks, for example, uh, for their new baristas to get onboarded onto work. So I see voice, augmented reality, progressive web apps, accessibility. Those are absolutely the things that we should be talking about. And also, um, I would say one more thing that I will add on to that. Um, Security and data is obviously a conversation everyone is still having. Um, GDPR was, you know, they released that in the EU and that was kind of like the start of, of being aware of how your data was being stored and how it was being shared. But the U.S. is still a little bit of the wild, wild west with that. Um, So I would expect to see more regulations or more things happen and put in place uh, for data security. Yeah. Did did the whole GDPR thing affect you much? Did did you, did your clients have to be, or you and your clients have to be aware of what was going on there? A hundred percent. We started, I think it was in May that they, the regulation rolled out officially last May or the May before maybe. Um, We started in January prepping all of our clients um, Mm -hmm. for what was going to happen. And and they all had legal teams who were already on it because we understood that this was going to be a big deal. So by the time the legislation was rolled out, we pretty much everybody had what they needed in place. And then it just, we continued to approve upon it because it changes the user experience a lot, which is what I didn't hear people talking about, I think enough, right? So it's not just a checkbox, but now you're putting it in front of your user's face. What data, what is happening with it, where it's going, right? That's a a much different experience that I think that people were used to. Um, So that was, they were really interesting conversations to have with our team about how to do it in such a way that wasn't, didn't feel threatening or scary, um, mm-hmm. but was still meeting all the requirements set forth by the law. Yeah, and it had a real, it had a real impact as to what kind of marketing tools that you could actually use. So obviously there's a, you know, the famous lead magnet mm-hmm. and, you, and, you, and you automatically get subscribed to a mailing list, yep. like just for downloading a PDF. Well, technically that's not allowed anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, it has to be very explicit and all yep. that. And yeah, there's a lot, lot of changes and I think well, in the UK, um, I'm sure in the rest of Europe as well, we're still we're still all catching up as an industry. You know, it's it was a, it was a mega change. So yeah, yeah and interesting. Definitely still catching up. But even like as an agency, think about all the inquiries that come through our website. Mm-hmm. Um, we had to completely think about how we manage leads. We had to think yep. about that completely different, which is not something that you would normally think about. But yeah. the, the US is still like we don't know. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. we don't know what we're doing with data. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Absolutely. Nearly time to wrap up. And I was going to read out a few questions from, from listeners, but you've actually covered all of them <laughs> pretty much. So that's, that's great. Uh, hopefully everyone feels like their questions were answered. I'll just, I'll just talk about one. You have mentioned this, but just to kind of come back to it. Um, Darren Pinder on Slack asked, do you have any guidance on pricing ongoing support and maintenance plans? Pricing aftercare can be tricky. That's paraphrasing a little bit, but that was the gist of it. Yeah. So the way that we do it, and it is very tricky because you have no idea what's going to come up, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, there should be a basic plan in place, whatever that looks like, whatever that I, I think of it like insurance for a website. So WordPress updates, plugin updates, backups, whatever that looks like. Basic plan that everybody needs to take. On top of that, I think the easiest way to do it and the way that we do it at Maintain is purchasing blocks of hours and just use them accordingly. And you could always re-up if you need to. And they Mm. don't, they're as good for the length of your maintenance plan, right? Oh, that's cool. So if you take out a maintenance plan for a year and you buy 20 hours, you have one year to use them. And I'm sure that everybody can think of a way to use 20 hours in a year. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest way to do it. But getting stuck in a loop of trying to um, estimate all those little individual tasks uh, is very, very time consuming. So. Yeah. What happens if everyone <laughs> leaves their 20 hours till the 24th of December? Ah, uh, yeah. So <laughs> you definitely need some um, regulation in place, whereas, like, you're going to submit this request and we have one week or whatever it is sure. to address it and then yeah. schedule it. There's no guarantees on when it gets done, right? Yeah. There's just a guarantee that it'll be, uh, you'll acknowledge it and you'll get it into the work queue. Sure, and sure. So people need to be comfortable with that too, unless they want to purchase an SLA and then they get immediate responses. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's, that's great. So just to wrap up, um, it's been uh, amazing to talk to you. I've, I've learned loads. Hopefully the list, our listeners will have learned loads too. If you could summarize your pricing advice um, to a budding enterprise development shop, what would it be? Be honest and transparent and accurate in what you believe is right for pricing. Because once you start to cut corners and discount and undercut your abilities, you devalue yourself. You're not making it any better for the client and you're really setting yourself up for some heartache. So by being completely transparent, open, honest, and accurate up front, even if the project, you don't get it and it doesn't work out, you will be setting yourself up for success in the future. Yeah, that is great advice. Are there any resources out there that you know of uh, to point people to? For pricing specifically? Yeah, pricing and and, and business development and strategy. Yeah, so uh, one thing I will mention is I recently got involved with the Bureau of Digital, which is based out of the US. And I went to um, a business development summit. And it was the first opportunity that I ever remember having where I got to sit with 20 other people who do business development and have very open conversations about Mm. clients and pricing and proposals. This is an area where I think people are very scared to talk about it publicly because um, you you feel like you're going to give away the secret sauce or like the magic formula. The truth is, is that we all struggle with it. Let's just, everyone I've ever talked to in business development sales or who does estimating does not have a perfect answer. Um, I think if we do talk to one another about it, we have a much better chance of of le- le- leveling out the industry in a way that's really going to uh, affect our clients in a positive light. And mm-hmm. also, there is just there's enough work for everyone. There really yeah. is enough work for everyone, and that's like the exciting thing about being in this industry right now. So anyway, um, that summit was really amazing. They have a ton of resources available on their website, which um, I highly recommend checking out. Um, And also, you know, some of the best resources that I have found have just been our engineers at Web Dev Studios, like just chatting with them about what it really takes to do the work. When they break it down Mm -hmm. to me and explain what they do when they install a plugin, for example, I really start to understand what that means. Um, So, yeah, there are two that I can think of right now. That's very cool. Thank you. I'll try to find links uh, to put those in the show notes for people. It's especially you mentioned it there people sometimes uh are a little bit coy talking about these kind of topics so i appreciate even more uh the time that you've taken to talk to me today uh it's been a fascinating conversation thanks so much for sharing your knowledge and your stories with our listeners one final question uh where can listeners connect with you and find out more about what you do yeah you're gonna find me on twitter a lot so twitter's if you want an immediate response definitely contact me there. And it's just Jody underscore Richelli. Um, But my email address, I'm happy to give that out too. Feel free to get in touch with me. It's Jody, J-O-D-I-E at webdevstudios.com. Easy peasy. Um, And yeah, I again, love to talk to everyone. So there's always something to be learned from every conversation. And Keith, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. 
thank you so much uh, for being on the show. We really appreciate it and hopefully speak to you again soon. I hope so. Thanks, Jody. All right. And that was my interview with Jody. I hope that you enjoyed it. Thanks again to Jody for taking the time to talk with me and for being so open, honest, and candid. And thank you, dear listener, for joining me today. If you find this episode interesting, useful, or enjoyable, I'd love for you to do one of two things. First would be to head over to pricingwp.highrise.digital and subscribe to the show. That way you won't miss an episode and we do have some great ones coming up. Secondly, please share with your network or someone who you think might benefit from this. It really helps to grow the listener base and get the message out there. That's all for this episode. See you next time.